Leo had considered the thought, what if God was to write to our nation? What would he say to us? How would we be tracking? Now I've often thought about that and wondered what he would say. Is he happy in regards to where we are in, as, in faith as a nation? The more I think about that question, the more I begin to see that we as a nation are moving further away from faith in God. Now, census, census statistics prove that. And in fact, this is a statement from the Australian Bureau of Statistics relating to the last national census back in 2016. And I quote, the growing percentage of Australians' population reported no religion um, has been a trend for decades and is, and is escalating. Those reporting no religion increased notably from 19% in 2006 to 30% in 2016. The largest change was, was between 2011 and 2016, where an additional 2.2 million people reported having no religion. Now, in three nights' time, we will again complete the national census. Will the trend continue on this trajectory as it has in previous years, or will there be an increase in the number of people coming to faith? The message of the cross is being tolerated less and less amongst our nation. But what is being tolerated even less is the thought that without Christ, we are all heading into a lost eternity, separated from God. Yet as distasteful as that message may seem, the fact remains that right from the outset in the Garden of Eden, there has always been, and God has always presented two ways to live. Even in, this, even in these times, everyone has a path to choose either by acceptance of God or by rejection of God, we choose our path and ultimately our eternal destination. Now God is a judge like no other. We judge the world by so many standards, but God judges the world on the basis of its faith in Him and its response to His revealed will. Those who diligently obey His, his word are blessed. In contrast, those who fail to trust God and reject Him will be permanently set aside. What is needed in these times is a bolder proclamation of the core message of salvation. What has God saved us from? He has saved us from self-absorbing sin that leads to an eternal separation from the Creator of all things, which is God. Let's open in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, bless us today as we come before you and feast upon your word. Humble us and open our hearts that we may receive your word in the manner to which you purposed it when the Psalms first wrote the Psalms. If we are blessed, let it be the Spirit that blesses. If we are convicted, let it be the Spirit that convicts, not the speaker. May the Spirit fall where the Spirit falls. To those that have ears to listen, may you hear what the Spirit has to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know how analytical you are or whether or not you've contemplated why Psalm 1 is listed as the first psalm and not Psalm 101, for instance, given the fact that the psalms are not in chronological order. There's a very good reason why this psalm has been placed at the beginning. The first psalm draws a line in the sand and sets up an understanding of God's heart regarding the rest of the psalms. Its subject matter is easy to understand, yet it's deep and powerful and convicting at the same time. 
It touches on two subjects that continually occur throughout the Psalms. It declares the blessedness of the righteous and the misery and future of the wicked. Man's spiritual life is set forth positively and negatively, inwardly and externally, figuratively and literally. Above all else, it summarises all that is to follow in the rest of the Psalms and for that matter, the rest of Scripture. It presents two ways of life, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. However, the key subject is the centrality of God's word in the life and fruitfulness of the righteous who truly love his word and obey. Now, two great thrusts flow from this. The importance and absolute necessity of the scriptures and the changed character, stability and fruitfulness it promises to those who make scripture the core of their lives. Now before I begin to read today's text as a way of helping us to properly understand the direction and meaning of Psalm 1, it's important to establish a clear ground rule. God has two categories of people, the righteous and the wicked. Now, whatever connotation you may, may have regarding righteous and wicked people, God quite simply calls the righteous those who have responded to him by faith and the wicked those who have rejected him. The wicked is not referring to the degree of sins on, on a person. We must get that out of our mind. Before Christ, the righteous were those who, by faith in God, observed the law. Their hearts were towards God, therefore God declared them righteous. Now, in Christ, God declares all those who have put their trust in Jesus as righteous. Consequently, as it was God who created mankind, and it was God who revealed himself to his creation. He alone has the right to declare all those who reject him as being the wicked. He created man to be in fellowship with himself. So rejection of that comes at a cost. Now God has spoken his word to his people before the fall, after the fall, after the flood, and now in Christ, up to and after the cross, and yet his word is still rejected. Having said that, it makes it easier to differentiate the trains of thought uh, that the psalmist is conveying by knowing that it's not a good person versus bad person psalm, rather it is about those who have accepted God and those who have rejected God. So today's psalm, uh, is Psalm 1. Read along with me as we go from verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of the sinners, or sit in the seat of the mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. The psalmist uses a contrast, or his use of contrast in Psalm 1 is so striking that it cuts through any grey area in what God is communicating to his creation. There's no wall room. There is no provision for those who say, I don't need God because I'm a good person. You are either with God or without God. 
There are two clear paths, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked, with two distinct outcomes, blessedness, stability and entry into the assembly of the righteous, versus cursedness and eternal dismissal from God. Now the psalm begins with three suggested contrasts. The first is, do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. By contrast, the blessed person is the one who is walking in the counsel of God. Now that's not to start, uh, not only do they do that, their lifestyle and character reflects that of God. Their life does not reflect the lifestyle of those who are without God. Instead, they seek to know and to do God's will in their life. This doesn't mean to say that the righteous uh, never take advice from people who are without the Lord. That's just taking things way too far. Many knowledgeable and wise people are not in the Lord and their counsel can be very insightful. It is, however, referring to where you place your value system, the direction of your lifestyle and the basis of your morals. The blessed person's core values do not come from the value system of those who are outside of God. As verse 2 suggests, their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, uh, law they meditate day and night. The word of the Lord has no place in the life of the wicked, so their counsel is not based on God's will, and that's what the psalmist is getting at. Walking in the counsel or the will of God versus going through life oblivious to the will of God. And we are, we are blessed if we seek the will of God and if we walk in the will of God. If we base our value system on the same system of those who are without God, then little by little we will compromise our, our stability in God and lose direction. Now that's where the second contrast comes into play. Do not stand in the way of the sinner. Now the, the psalmist portrays a shift in the posture of the sinner. They are not walking with God, but rather standing resolute in their rejection of God's way. The path of the sinner is completely different to the path of the believer. Our, God, our guide is the word of the Lord, and we walk with him as we discover his will in our life. So this throws up a quandary for the believer. You cannot be in two camps at once. Spiritually speaking, walking with the Lord and walking in his counsel through his word leads to spiritual growth. And it's in that growth and that stability that we walk away from the sinful nature away from sin and into fruitfulness. You cannot walk and remain with someone who is still standing. There has to be some kind of separation. Now our separation from the world, from the world happens as the word takes life and, and, and takes hold in our hearts. Now this separation can be easily seen in the relationships with non-believers and especially with fam family members. Now many of my non-believing family members do not agree with my God choices. Stands to reason really because before I came to the Lord, uh, I didn't agree with uh, the choices of some of my family members either. I was quite vocal in my unbelief. Now the third contrast is sit in the seat of the mocker. Do not sit in the seat of the mocker. Now here the person who mocks God is in no way walking with God, neither are they standing in the, in the way of the sinner, but rather their posture now is sitting. They have made up their minds and they are sticking to it. It is of no coincidence the order in which the psalm was written. There is a progression away from God, from walking to standing to sitting. 
Now notice how the further away from God one becomes, the more comfortable they become in their rejection of God. A God mocker is very comfortable in their viewpoint that God is a farcical concept and trying to reason it in the scriptures can be a futile exercise. But that's not to say that the mocker is out of the reach of God's changing grace because they are not. God can do anything he desires. However, the warning is very clear. Do not sit in the seat of a mocker. Now, spiritually speaking, have nothing to do with them. Walk away with God. For they will only pull you away from your firm foundation, which they strongly and aggressively oppose. Tolerate a God mocker for too long, and you'll probably end up laughing with them as they heap insults on God. Now, in doing so, they have managed to make you deny the one who has given you new life. By contrast, the person who meditates on God's word day and night, they are like a tree planted by the water. Now, as the tree soaks up water to produce lush fruit, so do we draw our nourishment from the word of God. And as a result, fruit is produced in our lives. Now, fruit is the mark of maturing for all believers. It comes only by the application of God's word that brings about change in our nature and our attitudes as it takes root. The more we absorb God's word into our daily lives, the greater the Spirit's capacity to transform us. And what I mean by that is, Paul said to the Philippians, let us only live up to what we have already attained. You cannot live up to something that you have not received. But if you have received it, then the Spirit will remind you and empower you to live out that word in your life. In John chapter 15, Jesus said, Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now spiritually speaking, apart from Jesus, we cannot be fruitful for God. Fruit is the sign of transformation and God transforms forms us through his word by the Spirit. The posture of the tree planted by the water is still and steadfast. It's not moving away from God because it is firmly planted in God and is nourished by the word of God. That's God's desire for all of us. And out of his love for us, he has given us, uh, he has promised four things. The first is that you will yield fruit in season. The second is your leaves will not wither. Whatever you do will prosper and God will continue to watch over you. Now all these things are spiritual blessings that come from a life planted in God's word. Fruit is expected and a natural byproduct of a changed life. The leaves will not where it refers to the steadfast dedication of the Spirit to keep us vibrant as the Word is lived out in our lives. The person implanted in the Word does not drift in and out of their faith. From the outside, the tree will reflect the amazing work that the Spirit and the Word has done on the inside. Now, Jesus challenged the Pharisees to first clean up the inside of their cup. Now that only comes from being washed with water through the word. And the psalmist says in verse 3, whatever he will do will prosper. It's not an avenue of the prosperity doctrine. In fact, it could actually well play out the opposite in your life. But the promise is that 
you will prosper spiritually and fruitfully in the ministry of the Lord's work. Now, the, the apostles were an obvious example of this. In many cases, they had very little to nothing materialistically, yet their work in the Lord prospered, producing great yields of fruit. In doing so, they found that their true joy came from being partners with Christ in spreading the gospel. Now, the final promise is that God will uh, God watches over the way of the righteous. Now, being planted, rooted, and, and nourished in God's way, He will keep you there, strong and on track. You will have a clear direction which is the complete contrast of the way of the wicked. Two promises await them. They will be like chaff that the wind blows away. They will not stand in the judgment, nor will they stand in the assembly of the righteous. The line of the sand is, is drawn deeply here in verse 4. The way of the righteous is contrast with the way of the unrighteous. The two parts are emphatically separated by the words, not so. The way of the wicked, <clears throat> the way of the wicked is nothing like the way of the righteous. They have completely different sources for living, different desires, different character and very different results, both temporarily and eternally. The psalmist uses a powerful word picture that depicts the ultimate separation of the righteous and the unrighteous. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Now chaff is the seed, uh, sorry, chaff is the seed covering and the debris separated from the grain of the seed in the process called threshing. Unlike the grain, it has no body or substance and is blown away by the wind. When the grain is harvested, it is taken to the threshing floor to be beaten. In this process, the chaff falls off the head of the grain. The thresher then picks up the grain and the chaff and throws it in the air. The grain is heavy, thus it falls to the floor, but the chaff is blown away by the wind, leaving only the precious grain in a pile to be easily collected. Now the picture is that the righteous and the unrighteous live alongside one another, as does the chaff and the grain. But there will come a time when God will separate that which is precious from that which is not. God's judgment is final. He affirms that by saying that the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Now in the introduction I made the statement that, um, and I asked the question. Let me reread that. What is needed in these times is a bolder proclamation of the core message of salvation. Now in your mind, Make a list of people in your direct sphere of influence. Of those people you are identify with, how would you separate them? Saved or unsaved? And when I think of my friends and my family, in light of the two ways to live, it makes me question, what am I doing about those that I love, that are heading for a lost eternity? We often refer to Christians as being saved and non-Christians as being unsaved. But what has God saved us from? Now most people would say that God has saved us from our sins. And that's not exactly the right answer. It's much deeper than that. He has saved us from eternal separation from his presence. We must never forget that. A sinner may enjoy their sin, but they will definitely not enjoy being separated from God. 
Our job is to effectively communicate the importance of having a relationship with God. Psalm 1 was not written that we may boast in our position in God. If it does not stir up a heart for the lost in you, then somehow, regrettably, Psalm 1 has been lost on you. God created mankind. God nourished mankind in the garden by his presence and his word. Mankind rebelled against God's word. God separated mankind from his presence as a shadow of the reality to come. God again instructed mankind by his word. God declared righteous all who followed his word. God declared wicked all who rejected him. God brought forth Jesus to be the saviour to the lost. In Christ, mankind is a new creation back in relation with God, being made right. God once again nourishes mankind by his word. At judgment, God will permanently separate those who follow him from those who reject him. There are two parts. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. There is one gate, the person of Jesus. As an obedient church, may we lead others to Christ, so that all of heaven would rejoice as another sheep comes home with the shepherd. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. But we're reminded that this word is not just for us. This is also for those who do not know you. Lord, please give us a heart for those that are without you. Let's just not sit contented in you, but look at those who we love who do not have you. Lord, this is a difficult task for us. Stir within us your spirit that it would empower us to have the boldness to step out in faith and present the gospel to those who don't know you. Lord, help us to start in our immediate circle. The world is so big, but our sphere of influence is much smaller. Help us to start there. Lord, Grant us the spirit of the heart for the lost in Jesus' name.